Hello. When I was a girl, children were to be seen and not heard, as the saying went. Bedrooms were for sleeping in, not playing in. Television had three channels, and not much of it was for kids. But at the weekends, we could go out uh, and uh, play, and with a sandwich in our pockets, and our mum didn't know where we were. Today's children have more digital media in their homes, in their bedrooms, in their lives, than I could ever have imagined when I was a child. But somehow we worry, are they as happy? Are they as fulfilled? Do they have as much to do as when we were children? I'm a social psychologist and I've been researching the way in which children and young people engage with the changing media environment uh, for over 20 years now. Uh, I've been working in, um, as was said, in, in uh, Britain, across Europe and in America. And I do my research by surveying children and parents, by um, interviewing them and by observing how they engage with the media in um, homes and in schools. And today I want to suggest that we need to think more deeply about the balance between the online risks and the online opportunities. Because on all sides, I'm hearing increasing panic about the risks for our children on the internet. And I don't think we're giving enough priority to developing some of the benefits. So, for sure, there are many things to be worried about and things uh, that, to be worried about for children on the internet. There are um, sites for uh, chatting to strangers. There's anonymous messaging. There's um, uh, sites where you find pornography, uh, violence, sites where you can um, share and encourage uh, race hate and self-harm. Um, there are sites which come and go, which the children know about before us very often, and which escape regulatory oversight very easily. So, and, and for sure, some of this really upsets children. In our research, we asked children to tell us about some of the kinds of things that concerned them on the internet, and they um, told us in confidence. This is just a, a selection of some of the things that they said. And the point I'd like to draw from these quotations is the, the range of things that is concerning children about the internet, some of which I think, as adults, we don't give very much attention to. But if we're to understand how common these experiences are, how many children are worried in this way, we need to do nationally representative surveys. And this helps to put things in perspective. So, a few years ago, we did a survey of children in Britain, actually also across Europe. And here's some headline findings of the kinds of risks that they reported encountering. These were children mainly between 9 and 16. And I, I would conclude that children in this country encounter what we might call modest but persistent uh, levels of online risk. But it's not every child who is seeing risks all the time. Overall, about four in ten children said that they'd encountered something like this in the last year. OK, so things change. And just um, very recently, we updated our survey. And here's how the figures changed in uh, just a matter of a few years. But as you'll see, it's a mixed picture, not simply getting worse, though there is um, a notable increase in the number of children who say that they have seen hate messages. And that might be because of the rise of some of those apps and services where children can, uh, or people can send messages very quickly and not always uh, see the response of the person um, at the other end. What's um, important to know, however, is that um, overall, one in, um, not, one in three children who encountered these kinds of risks said that it upset them. In other words, not all children who encounter these risks do say that it upsets them. Children can encounter pornography or even be approached by a stranger online, and it turns out okay. <laughs> So overall, our surveys have found that one in seven children um, who uses the internet says that something online upset them in the last year. And that number hasn't really changed in recent years. 
So it's with those figures in mind that I think we can, we can think again about some of these headlines because it's hard not to fear um, for our children when we see headlines like this. Um, and of course, the internet is associated with some truly problematic and difficult things. But the evidence, I think, invites us to think more carefully about which children are are encounter which risks or are upset by what um, on the internet. And our research suggests, for example, that it's younger children who are often more concerned about violence or cruelty that they encounter on the internet. Girls can be subject to sexual pressures and body image anxieties. And those children who have psychological difficulties or difficulties at home do tend to be those who get into um, more difficulties online, though um, not inevitably. So it's easy to understand why we might want to call for more restrictions, um, perhaps wanting to restrict every child in what they do on the internet just in case. And it would be, just as I think that would be problematic, it would also be problematic to assume that every child on the internet is just fine, we can leave them alone. Somehow we need to find a point of balance. And it's hard in a context of great anxiety about the, what the internet brings, because the internet is always changing, and, and change makes us anxious. So knowing that, I think it's very helpful to realise that, in fact, societies have worried about every new technological revolution. In fact, since the invention of writing, here's Socrates worrying about the invention of writing. <laughs> we worried about the printing press. We worried about television. We worried about every technological revolution for its effects on our children's minds, on their behaviours, on their moral compass. We've always had exactly these worries. I think in that context, something very important the research tells us too is that in the years that we've been coming to terms with having the internet as fundamental in our lives, there's in fact been no um, overall real long-term changes in any of the childhood troubles and difficulties that children encounter. No real changes in childhood abductions or sexual abuse or ac accidental deaths or mental health problems or suicide. What there has been, I think, is a kind of new visibility to some of these very long-standing and persistent childhood problems. So the internet makes visible sexual harassment at school or bullying in a way that perhaps we were not previously so aware. But the internet is not the cause of human misery. People are. And that's the case whether the rate of children's problems is going up or going down, or, as it were, taking a new form. And I do think it's taking a new form. So there's the fact of being always on, always reachable, always connected. There's the plethora of communication choices that face our young people, whether to communicate in public or in private, whether to be anonymous or identified. Um, the uh, array of choices that they can make about how to communicate online or offline is something that actually they're very preoccupied with. It's not that they don't make a distinction between the online and the offline. They're making lots of distinctions all the time. And I think we, as adults, should be discussing those um, more carefully with them. Then there's the way in which the very features of our digital platforms and services are becoming kind of part and parcel of the way in which we interact with each other. Every exchange now leaves a trace. Messages and images can be re-edited to be funny or cruel. They can go viral, reaching um, many people very fast. They last forever. So, and one of the, perhaps one of the most difficult uh, ways is that everything nowadays can be shared and searched and found and problems can escalate in a blink of an eye. And while we're trying to contend with this, of course, those very platforms are constantly being redesigned, redesigning our privacy and safety along the way. And that's a really crucial point. Because the internet has not arrived, as it were, from Mars. It is what we have made it. It's been made by the technologists looking for new ways to connect the world. It's been made by commerce looking for new and profitable businesses. 
It's been made by governments looking for new ways to reshape education, learning and work. So it's very much what we've made it, and it's also responsive to the way in which we as ordinary people make use of the internet. So thinking about the ways in which we can, we can design it, we can use it, there are lots of organisations out there now who are working to both advise the public to work with parents and children and teachers especially to think of ways of using the internet more safely and better. But those organisations are also working with governments and with industry to try to redesign the internet so that it better serves the needs of our children because those voices are sometimes forgotten. And that brings me to um, another really important point. If we want to understand how to make the internet better serve the interests of children, then we should be listening very much to children and to what they have to say. We can't assume that they react to things on the internet in the same way that we do. And as I've already shown, I think, they don't always have the same concerns and certainly not necessarily the ways of coping with what they find on the internet uh, that we do. So it's important that we don't assume they react like we do and it's important to them that we don't overreact to their experiences when we hear about them. One of the other things that um, I've learned in my research by listening to children and their experiences of the internet is just how difficult it is even to make that distinction that I've been making between the risks and the opportunities. And it helps me to understand why my research has shown that um, the online opportunities that children experience on the internet are positively correlated with the online risks. In other words, the more they experience opportunities, the more they also encounter risks. It's like becoming more independent offline. It, to become more independent and to encounter the world more brings more risks. And the converse is also true, which is to say that if we try to restrict what children do on the internet in order to reduce the risks, we will be restricting their opportunities too. And that includes their opportunities to develop resilience against possible future harm. What we also learn from listening to children when they talk about the internet is a kind of um, the blurry line in between risks and opportunities. It's very hard to draw that line. Children would like to make new friends on the internet, but we hear that as maybe meeting strangers. They like to have lots and lots of contacts online, but we worry about who those people are. They might like to um, uh, explore to discover health or sexual advice on the internet in private, but we worry about who is providing that advice. So there are lots of activities which kind of hover in between the risks and the opportunities. We might almost call them the kind of risky opportunities of the internet. Some have called it the online drama, the drama of being online in that state between the risks um, and, and the opportunities. Remember those early days when the internet first arrived in our lives and we talked about the, um, the great world of information at our fingertips, the chances for children to make new friends uh, around the globe, the new ways that they could learn and participate on the internet. Um, well, sadly, for many children, even in the world's more privileged countries, those great opportunities remain the exception, not the rule. So these are the top 10 sites visited by um, British 6 to 14 year olds. Uh, and many of those sites, of course, are very good. There's lots of good things there. But it is, I suggest, a rather kind of narrow and branded and commercialized and even rather kind of adult world that uh, children are spending a lot of time in. And research also shows that about half of children of that age group only go to sites that they have ever visited before. I think perhaps one, so, so some of those more exciting opportunities, as it were, to cl climb the ladder of opportunities is not yet in the experience of many of our children. Here's just some figures to show that some of those more creative and participatory chances are not yet within the grasp of many. And I think that's partly because we as adults don't always know how best to guide them. Um, do we, could we, um, if I ask the parents and teachers among you, could you think of 10 great websites for children? I wonder how many of you could. 
And I think you probably could for um, books or television programs or films, but can you think of 10 great websites or apps or educational computer games for children? If we could think of more places, if we could encourage a greater range of places for children to go online, and if we were more confident in exploring and encouraging them to explore a kind of journey of possibilities rather than locking them into rather safe walled gardens, then I think children would be spending less time online, casting around, not quite sure where to go, and so taking up some of those suggested links or um, opportunistic invitations that can lead them into trouble. It's sometimes said that we can think about uh, encouraging children to go online and explore just like we do in the uh, real world, teaching them to swim, teaching them about the roads and so forth. But here lies something of a problem, because in our societies, we're not actually very good anymore at encouraging our children to go out like I did as a child all day with a sandwich in their pockets and not really knowing where they are. In fact, we're not really very good anymore at letting them walk to school anymore by themselves, even though there's fewer accidents on the road than there were when I was a child. So no wonder that when children want to explore or even to transgress, they often do it today online. Of course, there's nothing new about the way in which children want to meet, hang out, play, take risks. But as a society, we need to think about where we want those places to be, and we need to think about who we want to be responsible for them. Of course, the internet is here to stay, and so it's right that we think about ways of designing for better safety and fewer risks of harm, but also uh, I've suggested today that we need to give more effort, more priority into designing and stimulating some of the online opportunities uh, so that more of our children have the chance to explore, create, and be imaginative online. Thank you. <laughs>